Good afternoon, I'm Lori Scott. I'm from the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine, and I'm gonna to talk today about parent-child transactional processes and affective functioning in adolescent girls with borderline personality disorder features. Now first, we know that BPD is usually first diagnosed in young adulthood and that in the general population, it seems that BPD is about equally prevalent in men and women. So why would we want to study subclinical features of BPD in adolescents, and particularly in adolescent girls? Well, first of all, we, we also have evidence that the dimensional constructs underlying BPD, such as affective instability and impulsive aggression, have a developmental course, and they start to emerge by adolescence, if not earlier in childhood. And so it becomes very important to be able to identify these earlier precursors or the signs and symptoms that precede onset of a disorder before the disorder actually develops. And then to develop these interventions that we can uh, directly target those mechanisms to try to actually uh, prevent this disorder from going on and developing into a full syndrome. Um, also, we have evidence that adolescent girls may be at particularly high risk for BPD, given that in clinical and forensic settings, at least, that the majority of those with BPD are female, and also that BPD is associated with greater distress and impairment uh, among those in the general community, among women, as compared to men. So it really seems that girls, and adolescent girls in particular, um, may be a group in a great need of prevention efforts. Now, research on the development of BPD in children and adolescents is really still in its infancy. Uh, but there are several theories that discuss interactions or transactions between child characteristics, especially those having to do with a constitutional or a biologically based vulnerability to affective dysregulation and adverse environmental conditions. And when we talk about these biologically based emotional vulnerabilities, that's a pretty broad term, but uh, that encompasses both chronic negative affectivity or high aggression and affective instability, which is characterized as high variability, high intensity, and sustained affective responses, all of which are superimposed on this chronic negative affectivity. Now, we have some data to suggest that the affective instability component of this emotional vulnerability may be a particularly important uh, component. It may be an early precursor to the development of BPD. Um, a lot of this data comes from the Pittsburgh Girls Study, which is this ongoing longitudinal study of a community sample of uh, at-risk girls and their caregivers. They've been followed for the last 13 years. Um, the original sample was 2,451 girls and they've been followed with annual assessments to track uh, the development of symptoms over time. In this sample, we've been able to show that affective instability can be reliably measured as early as age six, and that these measures of affective instability are stable over time. And then by adolescence, affective instability in these girls is associated with hyperarousal psychophysiologically in the lab and also associated with BPD symptoms. And then from adolescence through early adulthood, when we look at longitudinal models, affective instability predicts, uniquely predicts, the overall level and increases in BPD symptoms over time, even after controlling for symptoms of conduct disorder, depression, and impulsivity. So this is pretty strong evidence that affective instability is an important precursor to the development of BPD. However, etiological theories also strongly emphasize the, con the environmental context in which the disorder develops. And specifically, Linehan's biosocial model talks about invalidating environments. And those are environments in which the child's affective expressions are met with erratic, inappropriate, or extreme responses. Um, and whether intended or not, the uh, ultimate effect on the child is that their, their emotional expressions are dismissed or devalued uh, or ignored or possibly even punished or criticized. And then also along with that, oftentimes even more extreme displays of emotion, so these blow-ups, can be 
intermittently reinforced. And ultimately, that can lead to further emotional dysregulation, more uh, extreme emotional uh, blow-ups and uh, confusion and sense of self and in perceptions of others, as well as problems lab labeling and expressing emotion, mentalization uh, difficulties. Um, and then on the other hand, uh, it may be, uh, according to these theories, that uh, even with a constitutional disposition towards affective instability, emotional dysregulation, that if the environment is more supportive, encouraging, and validating, and acknowledging, uh, and, and helping the child to modulate those emotions by helping them to label them and helping them to um, dampen them um, and express them accurately, then they may function better, affectively, interpersonally, um, and prevent the development of BPD. So our central hypothesis for this particular study is based on these theoretical ideas, um, given that, um, that the dyadic uh, relationship between the mother uh, and the adolescent uh, may be a, a great window to look at um, how affective instability in these adolescent girls may influence their affective and interpersonal functioning and how their mom's behavior in the context of a, a, a conflict discussion task uh, may actually help to um, attenuate uh, any kind of negative affective uh, reactions in the girls and may help to dampen their, um, their negative escalation. So we predicted that adolescent girls during a conflict discussion with their mothers that their affective instability would predict more negative affect and less positive affective behaviors. This is from the girls in the task. More interpersonal conflict and less positive dyadic processes in the task. And also that uh, affective instability would predict increases in BPD features over time. But then we also looked at the level of the mother's supportive and validation behaviors during the task and not only looked at the main effects of that, but we predicted that especially in the context of in inadequate or low levels of parental support and validation, that affective instability would, would more strongly predict these negative outcomes. So in other words, on the flip side, we were looking at whether or not higher levels of support and validation from the, from the mothers would attenuate the influence of affective instability on these negative affective and dyadic outcomes. So our study sample consisted of 74 16-year-old girls and their biological mothers. That's important. It's all biological mothers who were recruited from the ongoing Pittsburgh Girls Study, or PGS. And the sample, um, the, the girls were sampled based on high and low levels of affective instability, based on their uh, self-reports on the PAI BOR affective instability subscale. This is from their uh, annual interviews from the Pittsburgh Girls Study. So the sample was designed to have a high degree of variability on this affective instability construct. And as with the larger PGS, this subsample was very diverse and high risk. We had 45% who were living below the poverty level as assessed by they were receiving some type of public assistance. 65% were racial minorities, and specifically 64% were African American. We administered the SIDP as a diagnostic interview of personality disorders at intake, and um, as we might expect with an adolescent sample and also the, uh, sample recruited from the community, even though we modified questions to make them more developmentally appropriate to adolescents, we still see a relatively low base rate of diagnosable borderline personality disorder, but at 6.8%, that's still much higher than the base rate of BPD in the general population. So that probably reflects the high risk nature of this sample. Also, 20% of the girls met criteria for some personality disorder. Um, and, and you see most, mostly antisocial, borderline, and narcissistic represented here. Probably a lot of overlap between those as well. Uh, most importantly here is that you see the BPD criteria uh, met on the right hand side and um, almost a third of the sample met criteria for affective instability or excessive anger. Um, so again, we see a high degree of variability on this uh, affective construct in this sample. The girls and their moms participated in a hot topics task in the lab, and this is a structured discussion task designed to elicit conflict and negative affective displays. 
The mother and daughter dyads discussed a topic that they both rated highly in terms of frequency and severity of their arguments at home. And the uh, discussion lasted for eight minutes. They were in a room by themselves uh, to discuss the topic and the interaction was videotaped. And then the tapes were coded by trained observers using the revised interactional dimensions coding system. And this coding system rates observable behaviors, vocal expressions, and body posturing. And it results in several individual codes where both e each participant in the dyad is coded on the same affective behaviors. And then it results in some di dyadic codes which represent transactional processes. So there's one of these dyad codes per dyad. Now we selected some individual codes and dyad codes that were most consistent with our hypotheses to use for these analyses that I'm gonna present. Girls' negative affective behaviors, which were uh, coded based on negativity of the girls' facial expressions, their body positioning and emotional tone or quality of voice. Girls' conflict behaviors, which were displays of tension, hostility, disagreement, or antagonism. Girls' positive affective behaviors, which importantly are not the absence of neg not the same as absence of negative affective behaviors. Uh, this was based on positive facial expressions, uh, posture, and tone of voice. And then the, the, we looked at the mom's level of support and validation. This is the degree to which the observers rated the mothers as using positive listening and speaking skills during the task that demonstrate understanding, support, encouragement, acknowledgement, and acceptance. Okay. And then for dyad codes, and importantly, these are transactional codes. So they really take into account uh, not any single person in the dyad. Both partners have to be escalating in some way for them to get scored on these dyad codes. We looked at negative escalation, which is a sequential pattern where negative behavior from one partner leads to negative behavior in the other partner and then back again in a snowball type uh, manner and then positive escalation. The same kind of thing, but for positive behavior. For these analyses, we also used some self-report measures, specifically the PII bore affective instability subscale, which the girls completed when they were 16, and 35% uh, of the sample of girls scored above the uh, clinical cutoff based on previous studies, a score of 11 uh, or higher uh, indicates uh, clinically significant affective instability. So 35% were above that. And uh, the moms also completed the same measure about themselves. So we had a, a measure of mother's affective instability at the same time. Um, and so we included that in these models because it may be very well be that the mother's level of affective instability has strong effects on these processes. So we wanted to, to at least control for it and then possibly even see uh, if it had any main effects. Uh, in order to test a longitudinal model, which I'll present a little later, we looked at uh, girls uh, reported BPD features based on the IPDE screening questions, which they were administered every year as part of the, the Pittsburgh Girls Study, and we had three consecutive years of their reports from ages 15 to 17. And uh, as one of our outcomes, most of our outcomes here have to do with uh, ratings, observer codes from the task. But um, one of our outcomes, we included the uh, participants' ratings, and this is the average within each dyad of the severity of their arguments at home about the topic that they discussed in the lab. So we conducted first a multivariate path analysis. It's basically a multivariate regression model, simply entering all, the, all of our predictors simultaneously as, and all of our dependent variables simultaneously. And as predictors, we had poverty, minority race, and the mother's self-reported affective instability as covariates. We also had girls' self-reported affective instability. The mother's level of support and validation, that, that's her behaviors during the discussion task as rated by observers, so her supportive and validating behaviors. And then girls' affective instability by mom's support and validation uh, interaction term. Um, and then, as outcomes, we looked at uh, a bunch of negative processes and positive processes, and we controlled for correlations between residuals of these outcomes. We looked at the girls' negative affective behaviors, the girls' conflict behaviors, 
the dyad negative escalation, that transactional process in the discussion, um, and the participants' self ratings of the severity of their arguments at home. So this is across methods. These other outcomes are uh, dyad uh, task or, or individual or dyad task measures, and then the severity of arguments is participants' uh, self-report. And then the positive processes we looked at included girls' positive affect and dyad positive escalation. And we predicted that girls' affective instability was going to predict more negative processes and less positive processes. That mom's level of supportive and validating behaviors during the task might also predict less negative processes and more positive processes. And we predicted that the mother's level of support and validation would attenuate the influence of girls' affective instability on these negative outcomes. So these are the standardized regression coefficients from the PATH model. Um, results partially supported our hypotheses. Now, girls' affective instability, uh, that, that's their self-reported affective instability, did predict the girls' level of negative affective behaviors during the task. Also, the girls' affective instability predicted less positive affective behaviors during the task and more negative escalation in the dyad. So the observers' uh, ratings of this transactional process of negative escalation. Um, and then that was that held across methods because you see that for participant-rated severity, all the way on the right-hand side, girls' affective instability also predicts more participant ratings of the severity of their arguments at home. So what we see going on in the lab from this observer ratings during the task, we also see uh, based on what the participants perceive as happening at home. The mom's support and validation predicted less girls' conflictual behaviors during the task, more girls' positive affective behaviors during the task, and more dyad positive escalation during the task. And then although we didn't see uh, an interaction between affective instability and support and validation for all of our variables, we did see it for dyad negative escalation and severity. And I'll talk more about that in a moment. First, I want to point out that we did see one main effect of mom's affective instability, such that uh, the more affectively uh, unstable the mom was, um, the less positive affective behaviors the girls demonstrated during the task. So here we see the interaction between girls' affective instability and the mom's validating behaviors during the task. And as you can see, girls' affective instability predicts negative escalation in the dyad, especially when in dyads when the mom is less supportive and validating. The more supportive and validating moms were, the less the girls' affective instability predicted this negative escalation. And then also, this is an even more striking result. Uh, you see that girls' affective instability doesn't even seem to predict the dyad ratings of the severity of their arguments at home about this topic if the moms are more supportive and validating. It's only in dyads where the moms are demonstrating less supportive and validating behaviors uh, that the girls' affective instability is, is really strongly predicting uh, what the participants perceive as the severity of the, their arguments about this topic at home. So this is really uh, interesting because we're, again, we're seeing this finding across methods in the lab and then uh, participants self-report of what happens at home. Okay, so shifting gears on you here, we're going to test now a longitudinal model where our outcomes in this case are the girls reported BPD features across three years of uh, annual assessments. And our predictors stay the same as in the previous model. So our predictors are poverty, race, mom's affective instability, girls' affective instability, mom's supportive and validating behaviors during the task, and the interaction term between girls' AI and mom's support and validation. And uh, this is a latent growth curve model that we ran where uh, the intercept is centered at age 16. So this is a, just a linear trajectory centered at age 16 because that is when our uh, predictors were assessed. And then our slope is the average rate of change, rate, rate of growth in BPD symptoms in the girls from ages 15 to 17. We had a good fitting model, as you see from the fit indices at the bottom. Um, girls' affective instability was associated with uh, greater uh, BPD symptoms overall at age 16, but did not predict 
rate of change over time, over, over ages 15 to 17. However, mom's level of supportive and validating behaviors during the task was associated with decreases in girls' BPE symptoms over time, whereas mom's affective instability was associated with increases in girls' BPE symptoms over time. And we didn't see an interaction here between mom's uh, support and validation and girls' affective instability. But we think that it's possible that um, this uh, process of you know, the, the mom and the girl uh, may actually transact rather than interact. It may be more transactions between uh, the individuals in the dyad over time that are predicting changes over time. But importantly, the girl's affective instability is, is more predictive of just where they're gonna be overall in adolescence with their BPD symptoms. It's the mom's behavior that's predicting how girls change, how girls move over time. So for one thing, these, these results suggest that measures of affective instability, even just self-report measures of affective instability might actually be used in clinical settings to assess risk for uh, development of BPD in adolescents. Um, and not just measures administered to the adolescents, also to the parents, because it does look like the parents' level of affective instability could be having an effect on change in uh, the adolescents' BPD features over time. But we don't know if that's an environmental effect or if it's a genetic effect, because this was all biological mothers. So that's something to be looked at uh, further. But uh, overall, these results do uh, indicate the the importance of involving parents in treatment for adolescents with, who are starting to show features of BPD or even just affective instability. And to the degree that uh, clinicians uh, can help the, both the parent and the child to regulate their emotions and co-regulate their emotions, and also to help parents to be able to understand and empathize with what their adolescent is experiencing affectively, to, to validate and acknowledge, not necessarily agree with, but to be able to be supportive and validating um, and understanding, then that might reduce risk for the increases in BPD features over time. But next, we really wanna move toward testing reciprocal effects. That's really um, the next uh, important step, is to be able to test transactional processes uh, using techniques such as actor-partner interdependence models, uh, and ideally with intensive repeated measures of these dyadic processes as they unfold over time so that we can start to disentangle, you know, causality, what direction these effects are going in, how are uh, adolescents' behaviors shaping parenting responses, and how are parenting responses in turn shaping changes in adolescents' behaviors. So I want to thank NIMH for funding the, the, this study, and also I want to thank Stephanie Stepp and Diana Whalen who collected these data, and I feel very fortunate to have access to such a rich data source. study was applied to a clinical population of adolescents of BPD, your findings might have even been stronger. I, th I think you're right. And actually, um, it's a relatively small sample of only 74, so it's, it's hard to start, start to carve the sample down into subgroups. So you lose power. But when we look at just the girls who um, were very high risk by nature of, uh, of being uh, in poverty, living in poverty, we do see stronger effects in the same direction. 